Paris that Jesus Exactly right, Isaiah. Jesus does love you. Isn't that good? Yeah. That's great. Let me see. While uh, Marshall and Laura make their way to the choir uh, platform, we're going to have Bob Cook open in prayer. Now, Bob's always glad for the good weather. And we're glad for this weather, too, aren't we? Because the Lord gave it to us, right? Amen. So, Bob, lead us in prayer, if you would, please.
Well, what a good-looking crowd, some of you. Got some folks under the weather this morning. Cindy Cook's not doing too good, so we, we need to remember her in prayer. Uh, we had a prayer list going. Rebecca has still not had her baby, and she is still driving Mom and Dad crazy. Uh, she cleaned the whole house yesterday, and I thought, surely she's going to have that baby last night. Not a thing, just nothing, so... Keep praying for her. When it's time, it's time. But, you know, she's getting a little irritable, crazier than normal. Take your bullet and let's notice some announcements for the day. Now, are you going to make it back? Do you think? I'm not going to have choir practice if you're not going to be here. So I should. Choir practice today at 6 o'clock. You don't want to miss that if you're in the choir. And Danny and uh, Katie are going to join tonight, I understand. No? Well, I keep trying, Danny. I know you can sing, so we would be glad to have you. Uh, Tuesday, December the 29th, the kids are going to a lock-in to Youth R, and they're supposed to meet at the church at 3.30. Uh, they do need money for that. I guess they all know what they need, and they do need a permission slip signed, and so they'll, they'll, they have all that organized, I'm sure. December the 30th is our birthday anniversary bash after the evening service, and Cindy and Ruth are baking cakes. Maybe. She'll be well by then, you think? If she's not, you can bake one? <laughs> Bob can fix the heater. Bob can't fix the cake. Okay. Next Saturday morning is our friends and family breakfast. You want to be here for that. Uh, we're having, from what I understand, everything I announced last week. Biscuits and gravy and eggs and bacon and ham and... <laughs> not quite all that, but... It'll be good, whatever we have, so you want to come and do your best to bring a friend. I'm so proud of Isaiah. He's working to get his, his grandmom and grandpa here today. Grandmom came last week, and grandpa came today, and so we're proud of him, and that's good. That's the way it ought to be. We invite friends, and we invite family, and they come with us. Uh, Sunday, January the 3rd, is our brief ladies' meeting and deacons' meeting after the morning service and inquire practice at 6. 10th of January is our vision business meeting, so the choir practice will be 5.30 that evening. Uh, Friday, January the 15th at 7 p.m. is the ladies' 2016 planning meeting. Do you want to say anything about that, Carolyn? No, we promise to bring our own calendars. Uh, yes, Isn't this one of the most important ones so they get their input on what you ladies are going to do all year? Yes. So if you miss this one and then you don't like what's going on, I don't want to hear it. Like when you don't vote and complain about the people that are in office, I don't want to hear it. You ought to go vote. So be here for the meeting, then you have some say in what's going on. Barbara, did you have something you want to add? Is that your birthday? Wow. Did we do birthdays this morning, Pat? Do we have any? Let me look. Let me consult my list real quick. I don't want to leave people out. They get upset if we do. Betty Sullins had a birthday. And Debbie Ray had a birthday, and they're both skipping out this morning because they don't want to have us remember, but we'll remember next week, won't we? All right. No other announcements in. Take your hymn books and turn to number 185, just a few pages over. Let's do the first, second, and last. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene. 
and wonder how he could love me. Sing out. Oh, how marvelous, oh, how wonderful, my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love. Second verse. And 174 in your hymn books. And let's stand together and we'll sing first and second and third and fourth. We'll do them all.
see that. Well, we had a, had a, as you did, I hope, a wonderful Christmas. This is one of the first times in a Christmas season that I got something that was too big for me. Yeah. Everybody said, well, you've lost weight. I said, no, they just didn't know what size to buy me. So I guess it's good too, right? Either way. But I hope you had a good Christmas season. But you know, this is a sad time of the year for a lot of people. There's folks that are facing the first Christmas without loved ones, first season without loved ones. And from uh, about pre-Thanksgiving till after New Year's is the, the time where there's more suicides than any other time of the year. As a matter of fact, I read just this morning a news clip where a man uh, in New Jersey, you, you know, you usually think of suicides as being people that are really down and out, and destitute, lost all hope, have nothing going on for them. And I was intrigued by the, the uh, uh, headline because it said, man kills wife and daughter than himself. And so I read the article, and the article said, in a luxury high-rise apartment in New Jersey, a man had shot and killed his eight-year-old daughter, his wife, and then killed himself before they even unwrapped Christmas presents. So it's a sad time of the year. It makes you wonder why people get to that point. Well, the title of the message this morning is How Not to Be Disenchanted. Uh, the Christmas season is one of the most enchanting times of the year as far as the beauty of the decorations. And uh, most people are in a good mood. Most people are uh, usually a little more jolly that time of the year. There's a lot of shopping going on. That makes all the women happy when they can go shopping. Makes all the men have to draw a deep breath and find a food court to sit down in while they are shopping. But we, we, we put up with it. But it's a good time for a lot of people, but it's a bad time for a lot of people too. Uh, I ran across this poem. It says, "'Twas the night after Christmas, when all through the house, every creature was searching, both me and my spouse, the stockings, the drawers, we looked everywhere in hopes the receipt for our gifts would be there. When out on the lawn there arose such a clatter, I sprang from the house to see what was the matter. When what to my wondering eyes should I see, but my neighbor too searching his trash on the street. More rapid than eagles he looked but in vain, and he shouted his creditors and called them by name. O oh, Visa, O oh, MasterCard, O oh, Discover, I'm appalled. I've thrown cash away, cash away, cash away all. He splurged once again, he knew it too well. And I laughed when I saw him in spite of myself. But then in a twinkling I heard in my head a gentle reminder from what he had said. I too was as guilty from my head to my foot. My conscience was tarnished like ashes and soot. I focused this season on presents and things and not on my family, my family, and my king. I spoke not a word, but went straight to my work, ran into the house, I'd been such a jerk. Right up to my wife, I came with a hug and kissed all my kids right there on the rug. The night after Christmas is better, I said, than ever recalling in Christmas is Christ. The best of all gifts which has been given, the best of all gifts which to us has been given is Jesus who died for our sins and is risen. You know, we have the choice in our lives to decide what we're going to uh, place at the forefront. And there's some people in this room that I'll guarantee you this morning are disenchanted. Uh, as parents, I know the feeling when you give gifts to your children and then after they open all their gifts, they turn to you and say something like, well, didn't you get me a... Or where is the, and you had already spent a fortune on them in gifts and presents and stuff you thought they'd like, but it seems like there's always one thing that they don't get that they wanted. And then after a while, you're digging through everything and the wrappings are all over the place and you uh, find a piece of plastic and you're wondering if it goes to one of the toys or one of the presents or whether it's a packing or what, and so you're trying to make a decision before you throw it in the trash. Then after you throw it in the trash, you find out that it's of that one little toy that you didn't remember, and now you're digging through the trash to find the one little piece of plastic. Anybody with me on this, or is it just me? You've never gone through any of this, right? 
and the toys get broken before they're even paid for sometimes, and everybody's griping and complaining because they didn't get what they want or it didn't fit or it's the wrong color or whatever. But there's something more important. There's some things that depress us and discourage us and disillusion us that we need to, to realize. Maybe throughout this year, you didn't get that promotion that you were counting on or that raise. Maybe during this year, you didn't get that girl or that guy. Uh, one of our girls is already frustrated because New Year's is coming and she won't be allowed to be kissing on New Year's. So I'm going to buy her a box of Hershey's Kisses and give them to her so she won't feel like she's left out in the cold, Taylor. But the truth is we, we get frustrated and we feel like we've lost something. You didn't get exactly what you wanted for Christmas. You didn't get the respect you deserve from your family or from your kids or from your friends. Something's missing and for what, from whatever it is, you've become disenchanted this time of the year. Uh, Patrick preached a, or taught a good lesson this morning on uh, what the, the problems have been in 2015 and what we can uh, face next year and what we can look for. And I was sitting there holding my breath, crossing my fingers, hoping that he didn't d dwell too deeply into that because we're going to fit hand and glove into what he said. The news gets really depressing, doesn't it? You can read about the suicides, you can read about the mall shootings, and you can read about ISIS or ISIL or whatever uh, other terrorist group is out there. Uh, you can read about the, the political uh, arguings that are going on and be disappointed because your guy's not on top or disappointed because the guy that's on top is on top or disappointed because somebody on the other side is even being allowed to run or, you know, all those things. And you notice I've been very good. I didn't even get political about that. I just left that kind of blank. You can fill in the blanks. But the truth is there's some things that we can learn to keep us from becoming disenchanted. This world will never provide for the believer what will always keep us happy. It can provide some things that will make us uh, have some joy or some happiness, but it's never eternal. And when I was reading this morning, I read a passage where Jesus said that you are not of the world. He was not of the world in John chapter 16. Pat read, read it, and as he was reading, I noticed I had underlined something there, and I read it, and it said, you're not of the world because I was not of the world. We just worshiped a Savior that came down from heaven a spiritual realm, and lived on a physical earth so that we could have salvation. And in our lives, we have been translated, if we're saved, into a spiritual kingdom. But the truth is, whatever your problem has been, or you're expecting it to be, I want to give you some thoughts this morning about how you can avoid disenchantment. I don't like to be down in the dumps. Uh, anybody here never get down in the dumps? Raise your hand. I'm, I know I'm going to get one or two hands over on this side. Go up. Yeah, there's one, there's two. No, not you, Bob, the two boys behind you. Most of us all go through those valleys now, and that's natural. But we don't have to stay there. We need to remember some things. And if, we, if you'll take the Word of God this morning and look and see what, what we're going to look at, I think that you'll understand why we don't have to stay down in the dumps. We, we can have some attitudes in our lives that will help us see that there is a future ahead, a bright future of hope, as Patrick mentioned this morning, and not a future that is dimmed by depression or discouragement or disillusionment or disenchantment. We have a Savior who's alive. If I was going to encourage you with just some very basic things, I would tell you I'm, I'm going to make some prophecies about 2016. The first one is the most important. God is still on the throne. And he will continue to be on the throne through the end of 2016. The second thing I would tell you is the word of God is still true. It was true, it will be true at the beginning of 2016, it will be true at the end of 2016. So those two things are the basis of what we're going to talk about this morning. So let's have a word of prayer and then we'll begin the, the message proper. Father, thank you this morning for each one that's here. I know that there's some heavy hearts here. Some could not be with family or didn't have family come that they wanted for the holidays. Uh, some maybe have overextended themselves and now looking forward to paying bills that maybe they don't know how they're going to do it. Uh, some have had other letdowns or setbacks, and yet, Father, there are some truths that can keep us centered on the future and the hope that we have because of Jesus. And I pray this morning that you would apply these truths to our hearts, all of us, and help us remember, maybe even jot them down so that when we start to get a little discouraged, we can pull out a piece of paper and go back and look at these verses again and see why. We don't have to be down in the dumps like the world. We rise above to another plane, to another kingdom, 
and we praise your name for it. In Jesus' name, amen. First thing I want to mention to you is found in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 18. We are going to look at some verses this morning, so I want you to keep your Bibles out. It's always a good thing to be looking at verses and keeping your Bibles out because, you know, there are uh, people who say things that are not true to the Word of God. And let's just turn it off and I'll stay behind because I don't like that little ring and I'm hearing in my ears. It's distracting me and I imagine it'll distract you. So put my, put this one back on, Pat, and we'll, we'll just do with that one. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 18. Let me get there now that I've been talking. It says this. It says, In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Now, we, we talked about these, these thoughts kind of around the Thanksgiving season, but the reality is these are truths that we need to practice all the time. Uh, what keeps us from enjoying Christmas is not being thankful for what we get or what we have. You may not have had all the family in that you would have liked to have had in, but you had some family in, didn't you? And so if you keep your mindset on those that didn't come instead of those that did get to come, those that did get to come and that you were around are paying the price for those that didn't come. And you're paying the price for those that didn't come. It's a sad thing when we let other people steal our joy. If we learn to give thanks for everything, that's what the Bible says here. It says, in everything give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Uh, you got a sweater, and maybe it's not exactly the style that you would like to have. You need to remind yourself that there are places in this world, and some places even in America, where there are some people that would love to have any sweater at all to protect them from the cold weather, regardless of the style or color. I, I look at these pictures now. The big thing is the ugly sweater contest, right? We did it a few years back at our Christmas party. It didn't go over too good. Just a few people took part. But, you know, some of the people that are buying ugly sweaters, I look at those sweaters and I remember wearing those kind of sweaters when I was a kid. <laughs> Don't you? It's amazing. And we were thankful for them back then, but now we call them ugly sweaters. Well, who's teaching us it's ugly sweaters? It's the perpetrators out in the world that want to sell us sweaters for every different function and keep you, uh, keep you one step behind what you think the fashion is so that you can find something better than what you had last. Listen, we need to learn to give thanks, as this verse says, about everything. We may not always like the present we got, but listen, the person that got you that present spent something or sacrificed or made it for you. Be thankful, if not for the gift, for the giver. They thought enough of you to give you something. I was very impressed. Katie and, and, and uh, um, what's his name again? Katie and Danny put their Christmas on, on Facebook. And, I, you know, there's a lot of bad about Facebook. I tell young people, you watch what you put on there. It's going to get you in trouble if you're not careful. But this, I enjoyed this Christmas season. I got to visit a lot of people's houses and see their Christmas like we used to when I was kids without ever leaving my house. And Danny, some, one of the kids, I think it was Dalton or Blake, made you a penguin. Which one was it? Now, I'm guessing that that penguin was made out of a piece of board. Was it not? But he made it, and it was cute. It was lovely. Just now, I don't know if they have a place in their house where they actually need to have a penguin hung up. I don't know if it fits their decor. I don't know if the color scheme matches their color scheme. But just the thought that that little boy put enough love and time into that uh, uh, craft to make it for mom and dad is a thought that should give you something to rejoice about and thank God about. We need to learn to th be thankful for everything, for this is the will. Brother Gilbert, what's, what's God's will for my life? Be thankful. Don't be grumpy. Be thankful. Don't be ungrateful. Be thankful. Develop a thankful spirit. Develop a thankful heart. Develop a gratefulness that shows all the time. Somebody holds a door open for you. Don't just walk through. Say thank you. Somebody gives you the smallest little gift or does the smallest little thing for you. Thank them. Show that attitude of gratefulness and thankfulness. And by the way, we need to remember every good gift, according to James, and every perfect gift cometh down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variableness nor shadow of turning, according to the book of James. God gives those gifts through people. 
And when people do things, we need to be thankful. When we get things, we need to be thankful. When we have things, we need to be thankful. But what have we become in America? Disgruntled and ungrateful. Uh, I'm getting really particularly fed up with the number of people that I see that are wanting all the handouts for the government and not willing to work. That's not scriptural. My Bible still says if a man doesn't work, he shouldn't. Some of you know the truth. He shouldn't eat. Well, you mean you'd let him go hungry? Absolutely. If he's too cotton-picking lazy, that's a southern word, cotton-picking, by the way. He's too cotton-picking lazy to get out of bed and get up and go earn a living, if, even if it's for a day job, if it's a temporary job where you only get a little income at a time, do it anyway. Well, I'm worth more than that. No, you're not, you lazy bum. You're not worth nothing. If you won't get out of bed and help yourself, man doesn't work, he doesn't need. We become an ungrateful nation. Looking to Uncle Sam to protect us. Looking to Uncle Sam to take care of us and provide for us. No, we need to thank God and be willing to accept what God has given us. You see, well, we may not have everything. I'm glad I don't. There's only so many things that you can take care of properly. There's only so many things that you need and that you can enjoy properly. Uh, at Christmas time, we do silly stuff at our house. I got the... Uh, two cans of shaving lotion. I got two uh, sticks of deodorant. Speed stick, musk, deodorant. Not the antiperspirant, I don't like that. But we got, I got two of those. Now, one of them is going to be saved, but it's going to be used. It's going to be useful. But what if somebody gave me 100 sticks of um, speed stick, musk, perspirant, deodorant, anti or, uh, deodorant? I'd have to pass some out. I could never use that many. A hundred, I only use about three a year, probably, maybe four. But you couldn't possibly use that much. You'd have to give it away or it'd probably go bad. Have you ever, we've had this happen to us. At Thanksgiving or Christmas, somebody gives you a turkey and you turn around, somebody else gives you a turkey, and you turn around, somebody else gives you a turkey. Before you know it, you've got four or five turkeys. So what do you do with those turkeys? Oh, man, I don't want all those turkeys. No, you either freeze a couple of them and give some to people who may need them worse than you do. You share it, but you're still thankful for it. The point here is in everything give thanks, you won't have time to be disillusioned or disenchanted. If you're thankful for what you have, instead of wanting something you don't have. The Bible says, how does it say it? Godliness with contentment is great gain. Content with such things as you have. What, what did you really need this Christmas time? Nothing. I could have gotten by without anything I got. So could you have. Because we already have plenty. So why shouldn't we learn to be thankful and, and show gratitude? Look with me in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 4. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 4. So the first uh, way to avoid disenchantment is to be thankful. In Philippians chapter 4 and verse 4 is another one that I mentioned just a moment ago. Not only should we be thankful, we should rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Now you remember, in everything give thanks, rejoice in the Lord always. These are not just once in a while type of concepts. These are concepts we need to get in the habit of practicing every day. Are you thankful for your family? Are you thankful for your spouse? Are you thankful for your church? Are you thankful for your job? Are you thankful for your shoes? I am until they start hurting my feet and then I want a new pair of shoes. But we should be thankful for everything. How about rejoicing in everything? Do you rejoice in your family? You know, there are times when family can get to be a real rub. They can get to be a real problem, can't they? Uh, I have teenagers, or don't have any teenagers now, but I have some just coming through and out of the teenage years. There's been some years and some times when I just wanted to strangle them. Now, I know I'm the only one here with those thoughts, but I just wanted to strangle them. But you know, our families are a gift of God. The Bible says children are a heritage of the Lord. He entrusts them to us. Now, we try to do the best we can, but we should always rejoice. This concept of being thankful and rejoicing goes hand in hand. Being thankful is not just to put on, and neither is rejoicing. You know, most people can tell the difference between a smile and a fake smile. 
can't you? You look at somebody and uh, we have that guy down in Texas that likes to smile all the time when he's preaching. And, you know, it's not always smile time. I was in a situation yesterday when it wasn't a smile time. What if I'd have gone into, into Betty's brother's room and I'm smiling from ear to ear and I'm saying, this is the best day the Lord's ever made for you. You're just doing great and everything's well. No, there's times to frown. But there's always time to rejoice. The, the soul rejoices even when there's tears coming from your eyes. When you bury a loved one and you know they're in heaven with the Lord, your heart is breaking but at the same time rejoicing. When your children are not doing exactly what you're wanting them to do, your heart is breaking, but it's still rejoicing because you've got the promise, train them up in the way they should go, and when they're old, they're not depart from it. You still have that reason to rejoice. We should always rejoice about everything. Well, Brother Gilbert, I don't like it. When you start to preach, sometimes it's too loud, and sometimes you're not loud enough. And sometimes you talk too fast, and sometimes you talk too slow. And sometimes you use those big words, and sometimes you talk like a hillbilly. Well, when you're a hillbilly, you've got to throw in a big word once in a while just to make people know that you're not as dumb as you think you are. The truth is, rejoice in the Lord when? Always. Always. And again, I say rejoice. Now, you say, Brother Gilbert, how can you do that? How can you give thanks? How can you always rejoice in everything? If my loved one gets cancer, can I rejoice in that? If I have a, a setback at work, can I be thankful for that? Yeah, you can. And I'm going to give you a couple of reasons why. We can rejoice and be grateful. We can thank God and be grateful. We can always have that, that concept and that attitude about us because of some reasons the Word of God gives us. Look in Hebrews chapter 11 with me. Hebrews, you'll remember, is the roll call of faith. If you read this book down through or this chapter down through of this book, you'll find that faith is not dead. Faith is active and faith works. Faith always does something. By faith, Abel offered. By faith, Enoch translated. By faith, Noah, being warned of God, built an ark. By faith, Abraham, and it goes on and on and on. But I want you to see verse 6 with me. The reason that we can give thanks and the reason we can rejoice is because of our faith in God. Now think with me here. There's a lot of people that talk about having faith in God, but when the rubber meets the road, they really don't. They've got the right vernacular. They've got the right words. They've got the right put on. They've got the right uh, concept of dressing. They know when to stand up to sing and when the amen comes in. They know all of that because they've been around it a lot. I talked to somebody recently, and they told me they'd, they'd gone to a church even from a little boy, and I asked him when they, when they got saved, and he says, well, I don't remember. I, I think I remember getting baptized when I was about five. You know what that tells me? He's probably never trusted Christ as his Savior. There's a lot of people that have the vernacular because you used to go to church. There's a lot of people that know about church and know about God and know about the Bible, but there's been no faith placed in God. Verse, uh, chapter 11, verse 6 says, But without faith it is impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. What's that got to do with the other things you just said? Well, if I have faith in God, I have faith enough to believe that he is a rewarder of them that seek him. Knowing that my faith pleases God and knowing that what comes into my life I can trust God that he is rewarding me in some way. I may not even know how, but he's rewarding me in some way. I met a young man at a funeral not too long ago, a couple years ago now, I guess, but not, not too awful long. And we were sitting and talking, and he kept watching these uh, young women, not teenagers, but probably 20s to 30s. And he said to me two or three times, he says, Brother Gary, I thank God. He told me no. I thank God he told me no. You know what he was saying? He used to want to date or marry such and such a girl, and God said, nope, nope. Now, did he think that that was a reward at the time? No, probably not. But hindsight lets us see how God's moving in our life. We can thank God. We can rejoice in God. We can rejoice always. We can give thanks in all things. Why? Because of our faith in God. We know that when we've placed our faith in God that he is pleased with us. Now, how do you do that? 
It's not by going to church, and it's not by taking communion, it's not by getting baptized. You put your faith in God when you ask him to be your savior, when you trust his finished work on Calvary to be the payment for your sin. We spend a lot of time trying to get uh, backslidden Christians to get right with God. You know, one, one deep-set feeling that I've had for a long time, a lot of Christians that say they're backslidden or not living for the Lord, they probably never trusted Jesus as their Savior. You know, I, I don't know of anybody that stayed backslidden any time in Scripture for an extended period of time. God doesn't lose his children. God draws his children back home to himself. God loves you if you're saved, and he will bring you back. He will draw you back, or he'll take you home. But too many times people forget that that situation they're in had to start with one time, at one point in time, when you remember asking Jesus to be your Savior. Now, how do we displease God when we reject Christ? When people turn their back on Jesus after Christ has died on the cross to pay for their sins, that doesn't make God happy. He wants you to have that salvation. He applied Jesus' blood to your account. He let his only begotten son die on the cross so our sins could be paid for. The only payment that could ever be made for our sins. This pleases God when we don't trust that, that finished work of Calvary by faith. Sometimes we displease him, I think, when we attempt to get saved at our own uh, time in our own way. Jesus said in John chapter 10 and verse 1, he said, any man that tries to climb up any other way into heaven or into the sheepfold is a thief and a robber. There's no way to get there. You know why? Because Jesus is a good shepherd. When Joe came in this morning, he told me his name was Shepherd, and I said, uh, is that like Jesus, the good shepherd? And he says it's with an A, so it's not shepherd like a shepherd and sheep. But a good shepherd will not let a thief or a robber into the sheepfold. He's going to protect his flock. So people who try to work their way into heaven or try to be good enough to get their way into heaven or try to purchase their way into heaven with any other way except Christ are thieves and robbers, and they're going to fail in their attempt. We have faith when we trust Christ as our Savior. And then what happens? Well, when we give our lives to him totally and we walk by faith as we have lived by faith, the Bible says as you've received the Lord Jesus, so walk ye in him. When we walk by faith as we have been saved by faith, he gives us rewards. He wants to reward us. Look with me in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. When you think about what Jesus means to you, you can be honest or you can make all kinds of excuses and play church and play Christianity and play spiritual. I choose not to do that. I, I don't want to try to fool myself because, you see, I, I know I, I'm not that smart, but I'm smart enough to know you can't fool God. So if you're playing around with this thing, you're trying to fool yourself. You're not fooling God. God wants to help you. He wants to bless you. He wants to reward you, but many times he can't because we're playing games. Look in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 19. What, know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and you're not your own? Think about what Paul says here. He is shocked by this thought as he pins it. What? After all I've taught you and preached and written to you and you've heard and you've seen, and yet still you don't know that you are not your own, you're bought with a price? Everything about you, your job, your home, your family, your car, all your stuff belongs to God. He bought you. He purchased you with the shed blood of Christ. He purchased you and brought you into his kingdom because of the shed blood of Christ. When you ask Jesus to save you, he brought you out of that other kingdom and gave you a new life. You don't realize that yet? Why are we not thankful when we try to be selfish? Why are we not rejoicing when we're ungrateful? 
When are we selfish and ungrateful? When we don't realize that nothing I have belongs to me. It's all God's anyway. I can be thankful for it because God brought it into my life and it belongs to him. And by the way, when you get that attitude, then guess what? He's the one responsible for the upkeep. Oh, I like that. You know, when my kids don't do everything I want them to do and they don't, you say, well, you're a preacher. Your kids ought to be perfect. Yeah, right. Yeah, sure they should. When they don't do everything they are supposed to do, I have this promise from God that they belong to him. When my dear sweet wife, who is the most beautiful, caring, loving person I've ever met, doesn't please me completely, I don't have to straighten her out. I'm not like the guy who gets his woman in the bedroom and says, now you listen to me, woman, you're going to do like I said when he woke up in the hospital, then they had the rest of the story. But I don't try to do that with my wife. She belongs to God. I can't change her. I can't change my kids. I can't change our choir. I can't change our church. But God can. It's all his. Thank you, Lord. I don't have to worry about it. It's on your shoulders. He wants us to understand that we are bought with a price. And look at verse 20. You're bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Now, what's that mean? That means I'm trusting him. That means I'm living by faith, and I understand that he has something spectacular that he wants to do for me. Look back with me in verse, uh, I'm sorry, Jeremiah chapter 29. Jeremiah, that's in the Old Testament, Phyllis. Chapter 29 and verse 11. Here's the concept. You don't have to be disillusioned about life. This world is not our home. We're not a part of it. We're just passing through it. If we put down too many roots and grab at stuff too hard, then that's when we bring the disillusionment, the discouragement, depression into our lives. We don't need that because we belong to God. We're bought with a price. And when you belong to God, I want you to see this, verse, uh, chapter 29, verse 11. God speaking. You want to underline this verse. I guarantee you're going to come back to it sooner or later in your life. God says, For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord. Thoughts of peace and not evil, and to give you an expected end. Then shall you call upon me, and you shall go and pray unto me, and I will hearken unto thee. And you shall seek me and find me when you have searched for me with your whole heart. And I will be found of you, saith the Lord, and I will turn away your captivity. I will gather you from all the nations and from all the places whither I have driven you, saith the Lord. And I will bring you against again into the place where I caused you to be carried away captive. Isn't that a great promise? Look at verse 11. I know the thoughts I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. Um, we're going to talk about this verse tonight, by the way, but the, the verse in Romans 8, 28, for all things work together for good to them that are called to them, uh, to them that love the Lord, uh, that are called according to his purpose. Don't you understand God has a plan for your life? And everything that happens to us is part of that plan. Sometimes, I, I was, when I was working on this message, I looked up and on the top of my a gun cabinet in my office, I have a, an eagle with about a two-foot wingspan and it's a carved wooden eagle. When I was in the Ukraine 20 years ago, uh, the, the guide I had, the translator I had, uh, gave it to me as a gift. And when he gave it to me, it was all put together. And I said, man, I, I can't get that home. There's no way I can get that my, my luggage to get it home. He said, not to worry. And he's broken English. And he screwed, the, the, didn't screw, but just pulled on the wing a little bit. And both wings come out and it collapses up. But there's some intricate work on that piece of wood. Have you ever thought about the artistry and the craftsmanship that it takes to take a piece of wood and make it into a sculpture? You have to scrub some things off of it. You have to cut some notches into it. You have to take some parts away. You have to polish it. You have to mold it into exactly what you're seeing in your mind for it to become that perfect sculpture that you see. And that's what God does for us. 
We say, well, I've got cancer. That's, that's a horrible thing. How can I thank God for that? Because he's sculpting you. He's using that to make you more of what he wants you to be so that you can be the perfect image of Christ. He wants us to become like Jesus. And to do that, sometimes that rough sandpaper has to be applied. Sometimes the knife has to be applied. Sometimes that smooth oil or polish has to be applied. But he's always at work. Can you imagine the truth? Can you imagine the, the, just the, the enchantment of this verse? Verse 11, I know the thoughts I have for you, saith the Lord. Thoughts of peace and not evil to give you an expected end. You remember I told you, you can be thankful for whatever gift you get because somebody loved you enough to, to, to give it to you. They gave it some thought. God never stops thinking about you. He thinks about you every moment of every day to make you what he wants you to be. When you first trust to Christ as your Savior, if you have, that's when that molding and that shaping began. He doesn't shape the devil's children. He leaves them alone. They don't want him, he leaves them alone till they come. He doesn't make them come. But once somebody submits to Christ as Savior and asks for salvation, then God begins to make them and mold them and help them to become more like Christ every day. Why can we give thanks? Why can we rejoice? Because God is always thinking about you. Always. Don't lose the enchantment of the Christian life because of the devilish world we live in. If you're here this morning and you've never trusted Jesus as your Savior, what a great day it would be to turn your heart to him. You say, but Brother Gary, my problems are so big. You don't have any problem bigger than a lack of salvation. That's the worst problem anybody's ever faced is not knowing Christ as Savior. But you don't understand my home life's a mess. Doesn't matter. You get back close to the Lord. He'll take care of those problems. He'll help you through those problems. You don't understand what I'm facing in my job. Does not matter. God has you on his mind. He will give you exactly what he wants you to have. Just come to Christ this morning. And Christian, maybe you're a little def deflated, disenchanted because of the holidays. Just remember God has you on his mind, has a plan, and he's at work in your life. Father, I pray this morning as we close this time of invitation that you do your work in our hearts. If there's some or one here that doesn't know Christ as Savior, I pray today would be the day that they'd see their need. Lord, we don't need more money. We don't need more stuff. All that's going to be left behind when you take us home. And so I pray that you'd help us to understand that. Those that may not know Christ, help, help them today to take a step and come to this aisle, come to this altar. And let us take the Bible and show them how they can be certain they're saved. And I pray, Lord, for those who are just maybe drifting a little bit or disillusioned or depressed or disenchanted, Lord, help them to realize how God loves them so much and has a plan for them. Our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed. We're going to stand together and Janice is going to play an invitation hymn. And the invitation very simple. If you're here this morning, you're not saved. If you'll come, take me by the hand here at the front. We'll take the Bible and show you how you can be saved. We won't embarrass you. We promise you. If you're a Christian, you need to do business with God. You step out and come as soon as Janice begins to play. You do whatever God laid on your heart. You step, step out and do God's business.